Hello again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher. Welcome back to the shop. And this is my tips number 804, which is part three of a four part video. Now you need to watch the other parts so that you understand what I'm doing here. But in part one, I disassembled this little South Bend nine inch lathe and talked about how I'm going to convert it. It's a Model C. I wanted to convert it into a Model B which will have a power cross feed. So this is the old apron. This is the new apron that I'm retrofitting. And in part one, again, I took everything apart and explained it. In part two, I made a new gear and pressed it on to this cross feed screw. And now in this part, it is necessary for me to put a keyway into the lead screw. Model C's did not have a keyway, and I'll explain that here in just a minute. Hope you enjoy the video, and let's begin. Thank you to all the wonderful men who have donated machinery and parts to me so that I could make this video. And I'll list those men's name at the end of the video. Now this is the old apron that was on the machine when I got it from John. Notice how much simpler this is compared to the one sent to me by Roger Taylor. This again was used only on the Model C with no cross feed. This Model B or A, I'm not sure which, but it, we're turning the machine into a B, allows you, or allows me, through the use of this gear and this gear right here to have a power cross feed. All right, what's the difference here now? Well, we got a lead screw here again with, I'm rotating it if you cannot tell, that uh, does not have a keyway in it because that lead screw went into this split nut right here and that is how the power was delivered to the machine for threading and longitud longitudinal feeding. In order to get the other features here, we still have a split nut used for threading, but we need to put the lead screw through this hole and, for that matter, the lead, the uh, half nut lever. And when it revolves, of course, it is turning the gear train and allowing me to have that cross feed. But right here is, and I'll turn this around in a second, is the key. So. Here's a sample that I made, it's just out of aluminum. And when that is put in and the lead screw is turning, you can see that this gear is turning. As a matter of fact, I would not even be able to install this lead screw without cutting a keyway in it or removing the key out of this piece right here. Okay, there's the key. I have a light back there so you can see it, and it's a long key. It's about three inches long, as a matter of fact, and it's 3 16 square, and it's fastened with two little screws. You can see one of them. And repeating here, I'll install this sample lead screw from the back side, if I can find the hole here. And you can see now how that fits in there and allows it to rotate. Now this system prevents wear on the lead screw so the lead screw stays accurate and is used only for threading and never just for the feeds although we are using feeds much more often than we are cutting threads on most machines. Okay I think I've explained enough the purpose of what I'm doing here. This is three-quarter diameter and I'm going to make that keyway on the new South Bend vertical mill donated by Lost Creek Machinery and it'll run from pretty much this end. This is half inch, this is three-quarter. It does not need to go all the way. In fact I can't cut it all the way because the table travel is not sufficient. In my humble opinion, a horizontal mill such as that clausing is far superior for cutting keyways than a vertical mill, but the table travel and the table size of the 
closing is not very big. It's, it's almost a miniature machine, whereas the South Bend has a 42 inch table, and that's even longer than my Bridgeport, which has a 36 inch table. So I could not do this on the Bridgeport, at least not in one pass. And I want to do it all at once so that I do not have to move the work because it would certainly rotate just a little bit if I had to move the work, reclamp it, and then continue cutting. So that is my reason for selecting this South Bend mill. And this is the inaugural run of this machine as far as my YouTube videos are concerned. Well, there's a bit of a collar right here, so that has to end up being in this little space right here so that the rest of the lead screw will fit in the T-slot. And I've already dressed up the T-slot just a little bit so there's no burrs. And I think this is a better way of doing it than trying to hold it with V-blocks. So I'll use three clamps like this. And the reason I'm using three is that I might have to hopscotch over one of them that might be in the way and I want the lead screw to be firmly clamped down to the table and into that T-slot. And again, I don't want it to rotate at all. So you'll see the clamps possibly in different positions as I do that. Unfortunately, this machine does not have a digital readout, so I'm going to use a dial indicator here as you see it because at this point I really do not trust how accurate the collars are or not really the collars but the screws because this is a almost a 55 year old machine and there's a lot of wear on it so I think the indicator is more accurate as far as me locating the center of the lead screw and that keyway has to be exactly on center as you can see here <laughs> I have moved the table much farther than I really would want to. We have part of the saddle sticking out here, but that's going to be okay because what I'm doing now is this is an edge finder with a 200 thousandths tip on it, stare it by the way, held in a 3 eighths collet, which is the same size collet as I'm using for the end mill. I like to do that so I don't have to swap collets all the time, but I'm going to bring the I have to unlock the table. I'm going to bring the, uh, move the table away and then lower the spindle. And I'm edge finding here. You've seen this hundreds of times. Okay, down I go, not quite touching the table. Locking the quill, turning the machine on. Did you see the edge finder slip over to the side? I know you did. Now the machine turned off, the quill raised up out of the way, and looking at the dial indicator, which is not in the frame right now, maybe I ought to try to get it into the frame, I need to move in the Y direction half of the diameter of, the, of this, which is 500,000, and half the diameter of this, I should say radius. So the radius of this is 250, radius of of this is 100 for a total of 350 thousandths. I realize you can't see the indicator very well, but again, 350 thousandths. That's one, two, three, fifty, and I'm locking the saddle, which you cannot see. And now I will swap the edge finder for the cutter. I almost forgot to explain to you why I was using the edge finder on the unthreaded portion here because I was afraid that the tip here might fall between two of the threads there and give me a false reading. So to me, in my own mind, it's more accurate on the bare end. Let me explain something here. I'm actually going to make the cut in two passes as far as the depth is concerned. It's about 93 thousandths. Well, why am I going to make two passes instead of one? Because this is a, a very small end mill, and with a deep cut, there can be a tendency for it to lead one way or another. That wouldn't happen on the horizontal mill. So I'm going to 
take about 50 thousandths off on the first pass and then I'll take a second pass. Of course I'm not going to show all of that. I'll just show you the complete first pass and then off camera do the other one or it would take way, way too long. Okay, I've got masking tape on the screw thread. I had to use thinner and clean this up so it would stick. And it's three thousandths thick. I will allow for that. So now I'll turn the machine on, watch carefully, and I'm going to raise the table until I just scratch the masking tape. Okay. Can you see the mark on it? Maybe not. For those of you that are interested, there's the scratch on the tape. Now I'm going to raise the table up with the knee crank 50 thousandths. And finally, I'm ready for the first cut. You know, I've done this in so many videos, I really don't know how much detail that I should show. Okay, here we go. Okay, at this point I have to stop and move the clamp, in other words, I'm going to call it hopscotching, from here over to here, and I have to do that with each clamp, and I won't show all of that. And now I have about 10 inches without any, any uh, obstruction whatsoever. I am using power feed, did I say that? Well, I'm at the next clamp, so I have to hop scotch once more and continue. I think you can see here that at some point I will run out of table travel, but I think I have enough. I would like to cut it about up to where the yellow clamp is. Okay, that's as far as I can go. And now I will go, well, let's see, how far was it? Another 40-some thousands deep, all the way back, hopscotching again. I will not show that because it's a total repetition. So that's how you cut a keyway into a long workpiece such as this lead screw. Okay, let's see what kind of fit I've got. Here's a sample 3 16 key. I think I've got most of the swarf out of there. Remember, I need a sliding fit. So I think it's pretty good. Ready to take out of the machine. Unfortunately, there's no way that I can fit this into the apron to check it 
because that's a very long key that could cause some binding. I, I cannot remove it. This is the only way of checking it or with a micrometer, inside micrometer or something like that. But I think I'm right on. That was a brand new cutter. Well, I'm ready to unbolt it off the machine. I'm quite confident that uh, the keyway will fit into the key of the machine. But one thing I'm noticing right here, of course I've been running the machine for well over an hour, but this bearing here is quite hot, almost a little too hot to touch. Although this machine runs much quieter than my bridge port in the other shop. But again, we've got to think about how old it is. And there it is, just like downtown. Now, I will take it outside, blow it off real well into the driveway. You know, iron is good for the grass. So, uh, and then there will be deburring necessary. So I, I will put it on the closing lathe and file it ever so lightly and then take a needle file because there's a lot of burrs on here. It, it is rough, but it's ready to go. So that can concludes this video. Be sure and watch part four as I install this into the apron and then reassemble the nine inch South Bend lathe. Thanks for watching. Lots of videos, or rather lots of still pictures at the end to follow. See you next time.